for this semester. Our distinguished speaker today is uh, Dr. Jason Spiromiglio. Uh, Jason is a senior astronomer at the Europe European Southern Observatory, and he's widely recognized for his contributions to the study of supernovae and for his work as an instrument scientist for major projects in some of the world's premier observatories, including ESO's EELT. Um, Jason received his BSc in physics in 1986 uh, from the Imperial College London and his PhD in astrophysics in 18, 1989, also from Imperial, from the Imperial College. He then worked at the Anglo-Australian Observatory uh, in Australia as a research fellow and later as staff astronomer. Uh, he was instrument scientist for uh, various instruments, um, as shell spectrographs and different instrumentation, IRIS to be precise, and he then moved to the European Southern Observatory, where he first uh, led the NTT refurbishment effort and later headed the commission of the VLT at Paranal. He has also been director of the La Silla Paranal Observatory, and uh, he's been the leader for uh, quite a few years of the EELT project uh, at ESO. Uh, Jason has been a member of the high z supernova search team that uh, co-discovered the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, for which um, the, 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 the team was awarded the 2007 Gruber Cosmology Prize, and in 2015, the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. And of course, Brian Schmidt and uh, Adam Rees, who are also members of this team, were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for the same work. Uh, Jason was also a member of, um, of uh, the Essence uh, Supernova Survey collaboration that continued uh, that work. Um, and he's now a member, as, as, as I understand, of the ADH H not CC program uh, that aims to determine the Hubble constant from core collapse uh, supernovae. And this is what we are going to hear in his talk today. So Jason, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I hope everybody can, can hear me. I hope I, I'm not sure I'm sharing correctly. Uh, how do I hide this? Okay. Is the top of my screen is hidden, I presume? This is it? Yes. Or... Yeah, we yes? can see. Uh, your slides. You can see the bar. Uh, no, we don't see it. I don't see a bar. Ah, okay, good, good. Only I see the bar. Okay, that's that's good. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I had hoped that we would all meet together at uh, at the uh, university, but uh, I gather the students uh, uh, object. So that's that's a different thing. Anyway, so this is a story about H naught and. Uh, I think in an in, in astronomy colloquium, it is actually worth uh, looking at this beautiful plot uh, that uh, John Hooker, whose picture is in the corner, um, has uh, made uh, many years ago, and it's been it's been evolved, uh, giving us H naught from the days of Hubble, where you know numbers as high as five hundred or Lemaitre, uh, numbers as uh, high even at six hundred. Uh, were established. Uh, the one of the reasons for putting this plot down is that you can actually see how we have evolved. The other one is that it's a word of caution about error bars in astronomy. Um, it's, um, uh, it's it's self-evident that some of the error bars were either optimistic and some are uh, maybe pessimistic. In any case, uh, the universe spent a long time being measured to be younger than the Earth then uh, younger than uh, the stars that, it, that were in it. But uh, we reached, certainly when I was a, a grad student postdoc, we had this uh, dichotomy between 100 uh, uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec and 50 kilometers per megaparsec. Uh, and uh, with the work of Wendy Friedman and the Hubble Key program, we settled at 75, which was a nice number. It allowed both camps to basically accept that, you know, somewhere in between. It wasn't the mean, it actually uh, was a, a, a very difficult and very uh, precise uh, measurement. And the problem with 75 is that in a matter-dominated universe, 
uh, it's still, um, the universe is still too young for some of its stars. So either stellar evolution was wrong or 75 was wrong. Uh, thankfully, uh, 25 years ago, uh, the acceleration of the expansion was uh, observed, allowing us to move from a matter-dominated universe to a lambda CDM cosmology, which then gave us a universe that's 13 and a half, 13.7 billion years old, and uh, everybody's happy because um, the uh, since the Hubble constant tells us how old the universe is, everything is solved. The age of the universe is uh, bigger than the age of the Earth. It's also bigger than the oldest stars. The cosmological constant fixed almost everything, and we're done. So the the talk could be uh, over here. However, we still actually go around measuring distances, and uh, this it's uh, it's actually a, a, a good question. So why are we still measuring extra galactic distances? Uh, galactic distances are, are very straightforward. The work that Guy has done is just absolutely revolutionary in determining absolute luminosities, uh, stellar populations, that guy is possibly the most significant science mission that has, that has flown. But extra galactic distances that are way beyond Gaia's um, remit uh, still uh, are a very important component of modern astrophysics. We live in, a, in an inhomogeneous uh, part of the universe. It's certainly not Copernican in, in our uh, little uh, bubble. The, uh, uh, we have all kinds of clusters, we have all kinds of motions, and that's not only important in actually determining uh, how things uh, have uh, assembled in our, in our local neighborhood, but also in determining uh, distances further out, one has to take into account these local motions. And I just remind you that although formerly the units of the Hubble constant are hertz, one upon hertz, uh, the um, the uh, um, the actual measurement is velocity versus uh, distance. So if your velocity is uh, dominated by, your velocity error is dominated by peculiar velocities, we certainly can measure velocities to galaxies to, to very high precision, but the peculiar motions are not actually known. So you can't actually do a Hubble constant measurement, an accurate Hubble constant measurement, so better than you know 1% 1, 1 or 2%, unless you are far enough out of our volume to actually be in what we call the, the Hubble field. So if you have a goal of you know a one percent measurement, then you really want to be around 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.1 uh, in your uh, in your measurements. Uh, the individual measurements may be one or two or three percent, but the accumulated uh, thing uh, has to be below one percent. So what's the controversy about H naught? This is not news, certainly not in the natural physics or physics department, but might as well just go through it is that when you uh, determine H naught from the uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background, uh, you actually get one value. And when you measure H naught with CFIDs and supernova 1A or other measures, you get a different value. And as long as the error bars were large, it didn't really matter. I was being very uh, precise with my language because it must be clear that the CMB does not measure H naught. The CMB infers H0. The CMB uh, measurements determine a cosmology with supreme precision at, uh, at the era of recombination. And based on that cosmology, you can play the, uh, the universe forwards and actually determine what the Hubble value, the expansion parameter at T0 now, us, uh, would actually be. So um, that's the CMB value, the uh, CFID value is working the other way. It's a classical thing where you measure distances and speeds uh, looking outwards from T0. And as long as you get into the isotropic environment, you are doing, uh, you're measuring H0. It, it is a measurement of the expansion of the universe now, as opposed to an inference. But in any case, there's this big difference. And the reason this becomes interesting is because the error bars have become actually very small. The measurements are very precise. 
And this is what we call the tension, Hubble tension. It could be that it is a, uh, uh, it's not quite a discrepancy because we're not at five sigma yet, but we're not far from five sigma. And uh, much as uh, we have tried this, this problem is not going away. One of the things that is happening is that other methods are, are being used, but to date, they're not conclusive. So uh, what exactly is the Hubble tension in, in, uh, in this plot? I just wanted to make a point that, that it's not only the C fields and, uh, and the supernovae that have a high value of H naught. A lot of the late universe of the, the now measurements seem to be on the long side and the early measurements or measurements anchored to the early data are on the low side. So if this actually um, really uh, pans out to be uh, correct and not uh, an artifact of data or analysis, then our cosmology is broken again, which would be, at least, I think, certainly interesting uh, to, to try and work out how and why. So this is actually occupying a, a, a big chunk of a lot of the community. So how do you uh, resolve this tension? Uh, one is to actually work out what's wrong with the existing uh, measurements. Uh, and that has been taking place with some rigor and vigor over, over the past years. Um, the CMB uh, measurements are a one-off uh, instantiation, so it's very difficult to do much better than just, you know, say these people know what they're doing and they've been extremely careful and other people in that game have been doing it as well and they all agree. But in the side of the C feeds, the 1As and the other methods, there is a really concerted effort to see if there's something wrong to the extent that uh, a couple of years ago uh, independent teams went back to the raw data from space telescope and did their own analysis of the CFIDs with their own tools different methods these were CFID experts as opposed to um, a mixture of cosmologists supernova experts CFID experts these were people who were just worried whether the CFIDs themselves were correct uh, their own crowding, their own uh, photometry, really back to the raw data, no, no process data. And they did not find any error in what had been done. So this seems to be, uh, you know, this, this effort continues, this looking for systematics and limitation. The other one is to come up with a new or independent way to determine uh, the distance to the... Uh, uh, to the galaxies that are in the Hubble flow such that we can actually turn the Hubble course. So one version of this is indeed that uh, measurements of strong lensing. This is an independent geometric uh, method based on the time delays of lens quasars. There's a number of groups that, uh, doing this, one of them uh, led by one of the collaborators in the project I'm talking about now, uh, Sherry Chu is actually doing this as well. Um, they uh, have, uh, at the end of the day, various limitations in terms of the ability to model the lens and how, how uh, accurate the photometry is, et cetera, et cetera. But they are also in the process of reducing those errors or at least having more and more uh, objects to work on. And this is very, very promising. What I'm going to um, talk about today is a, a different use of supernova. So uh, let's just take a step back and go to the, the distance ladder. Uh, that is the modern version of it, which basically only has three, three, three rungs in, in it. There's only three steps in the modern distance ladder. There is, uh, in this plot at the, at, at the bottom left, you have of, of the charts, you have the uh, geometry, so you have parallaxes tying down the C feeds to uh, in in the in the Milky Way uh, parallax from HST initially, and then HST and Gaia. Uh, for it's C feeds are difficult, so it's not automatically the case that the Gaia 
parallaxes are better than the HST parallaxes, but this has been harmonized. It's, it's, it's a colossal effort to do absolute astronomy. Astronomy is very difficult. Um, then there is a distance to the LMC, which is tied down with eclipsing binaries. Uh, it's again a geometric uh, method. It's, it's super, super precise. We can then go up to M31 and, uh, uh, and some other galaxies. And then we start getting into uh, an era where we actually pushing the CFITs into galaxies that also have 1A supernova. And that is a volume limited uh, problem where you only have so many supernovae. There's uh, 42 in this paper, I think we would get one of these every few years. So the statistics here are not going to change dramatically. But that ties the supernovae to the CFIDs, and then the supernovae go out to uh, into the Hubble flow and into high redshifts very easily. And that work has, uh, is now super robust. It's, uh, it's factory-like uh, and, uh, and, and very, very uh, accurate. Progress. Sorry? Sorry. Okay, I continue. In any case, so this is the um, uh, uh, the three rung ladder, uh, local group uh, out to galaxies in uh, out to about a hundred megaparsecs, where you can get CFITs and supernovae, and then out into the Hubble. If you really wanted to do this, however, uh, uh, without relying on C feeds or something else, you'd want to jump directly into the Hubble flow. So what you'd like to do is cut through that part of the, uh, the, the this problem. As I showed you before, you don't want to go too far in to the Hubble flow because then the cosmology starts to place. So you want to be around 0.1, a uh, bit less. Uh, but you also don't want to be uh, so far below 0.1 that the uh, peculiar uh, velocities uh, come into play. And you want a method that is overall accurate to about 3% so that statistically you can work your way down. So this is where this uh, program that uh, I'm, I'm part of, uh, the ad hoc collaboration, where we intend to just bypass the cosmic distance ladder and we use type two supernovae as, as the distance indicators. So the, it stands for accurate determination of H naught from core collapse supernovae. It is led by Bruno Leibengut and Wolfgang Hillebrand. They're the two PIs uh, from ESO and the uh, Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics and also the Technical University in Munich. We're all on the same campus. I have to say that most of the heavy lifting is being done by two uh, postdocs, uh, Stefan Tauntenberg and Christian Ferg, and a graduate student, uh, Geza Kserniv, who is, uh, uh, I, he will come up a lot in these conversations. Sometimes you're blessed with graduate students that are so much better than anything that you have ever imagined. And uh, Geza is one of these people. We also have uh, people like Stefan Blondin and Andreas Floss were experts in radiative transfer, both early and, and, and late time. And as I said, Sherry, who uh, does uh, uh, H naught from, uh, from many different directions. In addition, there are members of the collaboration across Europe who also uh, participate, but they're not in the core uh, where uh, the, the data is being processed. So this is us. Uh, in uh, in the garden at the Max Planck, uh, uh, I'm, I took the picture. Uh, Stefan Blondin. I don't know if you can see my cursor. In any case, uh, Stefan Blondin is also in a photo because he's on Teams or Zoom or one of those. And Bruno and uh, Wolfgang. Up here front is is Geza uh, with uh, the mask on his arm. Anyway, the website is there, and uh, there's more things there. Anyway, so let's go to type two supernovae. Type two supernovae are exploding red supergiant stars. Uh, it's, they are actually plentiful. So if you just uh, uh, have a volume limited sample, it's not only that there are more type twos than the other types, they are also the majority of the supernovae. So 
they they blow up uh, quite regularly. You will you will, you will keep on finding them, and uh, we do understand a fair bit about them because you know we've seen progenitors. There's there's all kinds of information we have, and I want to spend a little bit of time now convincing you that we do really understand them because this will be quite an important factor in using them as distance indicators. Um, so they um, they're observable up to sufficient redshift they're bright enough and there's there's lots of them so that's a that's a good good part of all of this so what what's happening in in the in the early part of the light curve is that the star blows up and you actually get a fairly classical photosphere forming within the hydrogen envelope of, of the star so you know normal thing the surface of last scattering the electron scattering photosphere is is there the it's the ejector uh, expanding uh, the photosphere is uh, is the surface of last scattering and the uh, ejector heated from inside uh, from the radioactive decay of nickel 56 the explosion energy itself actually just blows the star apart it doesn't heat it up so much it is the heat from the radioactivity that uh, powers most of these supernova. One of the nice things, however, is as this uh, diagram shows, as the supernova expands, if you uh, if we did the graphic uh, really well, you notice that the uh, photosphere doesn't move very much, and that is a combination of the density profile uh, of of the supernova. And as the ejector expand the surface of last scattering actually in absolute space for some period of time stays more or less fixed. And since we're talking about scattering, this is more, the temperature is more or less fixed. The, the size is more or less fixed. So the luminosity is fixed because that's all, that's all that's happening to first approximation. And if this is true, then what you should see is indeed a plateau in the light curve, the period of time when the photosphere doesn't change so much in temperature and radius, they change, but not by much. And you get this flat light curve. And this uh, is exactly what you observe. There is a class of supernova called type two P's, P for plateau. And that's the what they explain. So in this configuration, we're talking about relatively straightforward Physics it is a, a photosphere in a hydrogen envelope that is more or less fixed. And all you need to do is determine how big it is and how hot it is. And this is the essence of the expanding photosphere method. Uh, for those uh, old enough, they may, may know it as the bader vesseling method, which was used for, um, uh, for winds of stars, it's not quite exactly the same thing, the formulation for supernova, and that's why we, we don't call it the bader vesseling method, we call it the expanded first sphere method, was formulated by Kirchner and Kwan in, uh, in 1974. But fundamentally, it comes down to those two questions. How big is the thing and how hot is the thing? If you know how big and how hot it is, you know how bright it is. If you know how bright it is, you know how far away it is. This is an absolute measurement of how bright something is. It's not a relative measurement. It is an absolute measurement of how bright this is. There are no local anchors. So how big? You have an expanding photosphere, that means you have gas on top of it. Some of the gas on top of it is absorbing, and some of, and the gas that is not in the line of sight is scattering towards you. And this gives you the P Cygni profile that uh, I think most uh, most people have either heard of, seen, uh, experienced, depending on on your field. The minimum of the P Cygni profile gives you the velocity of the photosphere. The maximum of the P Cygni gives you the zero velocity. So now you know how fast the photosphere is moving. All you need to know is how long it has been doing it for, and then you have the size. And how long is determined by how actually you can determine the explosion date, which comes from the light curve. And okay, this case is is a, a Kepler light curve, so this is known down to a few minutes, but certainly a fraction of a day is something that we quite regularly 
uh, able to to determine. The early part of the explosion is literally a ballistic uh, explosion. The supernova does expand homologously, so this arithmetic is is relatively straightforward. It's time uh, times uh, speed, uh, same way as our universe expands homologously to, until acceleration. So, so now we have the size. How hot is the supernova? You can just do something trivial. It will, well, turns out it's not quite right, but you can actually just fit a black body to the spectrum and go, okay, that's how uh, hot it is. And you, the, you can get it from photometry, you can get it from the spectroscopy. So you get size and temperature. These are the essence. This is the essence of the, of the method. And between those, you can actually get the uh, luminosity and the distance. It's not quite so simple. It never is. Uh, it's not really a black body. There are line features. There's less fat flux in different places due to the scattering processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of this has been known since the early '80s. This is not a nothing nothing new about this. We've in the past encapsulated all of this into a thing we call the dilution factor. And this is this is zeta here. Uh, I could try and say it in English, but it would be really weird. Zeta, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. I know how to do it in Greek, but it's, it's, in English it's more difficult. In any case, the method is basically comes down to, uh, can you determine the temperature and the radius, and then you go. So that's that's where we are. We can try it, and you can do this for a, uh, a supernova like uh, 2005 CS. You have a bunch of spectra. You fit a bunch of uh, diameters, etc., and you get a distance out of this, uh, which is good to you know, uh, the percentage that, that you would want. But this is not really accurate enough. What you really want is to do a full radiative transfer calculation on the entire spectrum and determine in one go the velocity of the photosphere, uh, the temperature, the, uh, and the luminosity. In effect, you would actually fit for everything and get the luminosity. You can say, well, how good can these models be? I'd like to remind you that that's how we do all distances these days. The days when we calibrated Vega against lamps are now over. We actually do models of white dwarfs and calculate distances against models of white dwarfs. So if you understand the object enough, this is actually something that in general, the astronomical community seems to be quite happy. And this effort has been uh, recognized for some time that you can actually do this. You can fit, it's called the tailored expansion, expanding photosphere method. You can fit the spectrum rather well. You just need good codes. And in our collaboration, we're running a code called TARDIS, which is a Monte Carlo radiative transfer uh, code, which then uh, you can change the parameters to until you get a nice fit. And I'm going to play a movie. I hope the movie works uh, in the sense that you can see it and my Wi-Fi connection is good enough. I can see it very nicely. I hope it works for you too. And you see the blue line and the, these are thousands of models being run against a supernova spectrum uh, from, called, from a supernova called 99EM, which was extremely well observed. And uh, certainly in the supernova game, this, is a, this is, would be regarded as a very good fit to the data. And in this process, you can actually uh, get everything. This is kind of expensive uh, computationally to do. So what we actually do uh, is we create a, we have a thing we call the spectral emulator. So you, you, you assuming that the uh, space between different compositions, different velocities, different temperatures is continuous and differentiable, you can actually interpolate between different locations. So what you do is you create a landscape of model space and that, uh, and through which you can interpolate to find other properties. This allows us to go from taking a day per spectrum, uh, computational day, not only human, uh, to 10 milliseconds per spectrum. So you can actually do this super fast. And uh, we believe uh, not only super accurately, but also 
extremely reproducibly so in the sense of tracking your errors and your fitting properties uh, very well so if you're running bayesian models and trying to find things this this speed is is actually necessary to be able to explore the entire parameter space but anyway so that's our modeling of the spectrum so we have uh, no distance ladder because we can go out there directly for the one for the type twos we can go to a redshift of uh, point 0.1 about there as we get it and the question is is our accuracy good enough so this is exactly the same slide I had before I'm just uh, producing it one more time so with so let's do this it can't be that hard what do we need to put into a shopping basket we need some supernovae between redshift 0.4 to 0.8 be good uh, we need uh, to have good data so that we can actually do the, the distance determination. We need the method, okay? And we need good, well-calibrated spectrum, not uh, a spectrum from one observatory, another spectrum from another observatory, all kinds of stuff like that. We need a well uh, get machine. So that should be doable, right? We've been observing supernovae for decades. Well, unfortunately, that data set doesn't, did not exist. So that's why we did ad hoc. We actually set out with a long-term program on the VLT to observe with one instrument, FORS2, 20-odd uh, supernovae with the necessary uh, coverage. So it's not just one spectrum per thing, but we take a whole series of spectra, so it has to be a consistent measurement, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where we are. We have actually taken the data uh, and we are in the process of, pro uh, of processing them. So now I'm going to spend a couple of words. So this is the data set that we've acquired. You see the redshifts, you see the distribution of the sky. Uh, it's, it's all, all of that fits the observations have, have, been, uh, have been taken and we are in the process of coming up with results. So you're not going to hear the answer today. Although there is a number of H mods, so don't you can stay to the end. It won't be uh, not too bad. So does the method actually work? Okay, because I, I think I've sold, tried to sell a good uh, thing, but uh, I, does it actually work? So how would you test in astronomy? Doing uh, you know this thing where you're going to make the experiment reproducible is very hard. Because, okay, if you're just going to go off and observe the same star with a, another spec graph, that, that's, that's okay. But that's not the whole experiment. That's just a data set, then you have to have different methods. So we, we actually have been extremely lucky because the universe is really big. And assuming physics allows it, the universe will provide. What will it provide? It will provide reproducibility. So there are sibling supernovae. These are supernovae that occur in the same galaxy. So you can measure the distance to supernova one and you can measure the distance to supernova two and then see if your method works. If one is in one place and the other is in another place, there's something wrong with your method. If, if, if there's something wrong with the analysis of your statistics, you will have weird, weird numbers. So we actually uh, uh, have an internal consistency method thing to measure okay so geza the, the magic grad student went off and found in all the catalogs 20 uh, galaxies that had type 2 supernovae that had uh, sufficient uh, uh that had we had data however it's not enough to have data you actually have to have decent data in the sense that you actually it would be good to have more than one spectrum so it's okay and it would also be good that it is on the plateau it would also be good that it's well calibrated so it actually has photometry these things it would be good i think is an exaggeration is necessary and also the most critical thing is that you know when it exploded this t0 number to tell you the size so out of the 20 Unfortunately, only four at the time that this uh, slide was made were usable, which resulted in uh, Geza having a, 
uh, a sad face. I've stolen this slide from him. Here are the four sibling pairs, these uh, uh, galaxies. And now I'm going to show you the, the, the spectra and the fits. So typically there's always in one of these talks, here's a typical fit, you know, and I've done it, uh, lots of people show a very nice fit. But there you've picked the spectrum and you've gone, this is it. In this case, I don't get to pick the spectrum. These are the siblings. If it didn't fit, it didn't fit. It's not a thing. These are our fits. And they're pretty good, actually. In fact, if I zoom in a little bit on, on one of them, it, this, this is actually a, a, a very good uh, fit for, for the M61. So we can run the entire machine, get to the, uh, to the distances, and what these, what you're seeing here are the posterior distributions for the distances. So this is a full Bayesian thing. Everybody's, we all do this now, whether we got taught it at school or did not get taught it at school, doesn't matter. This is the way we do it all. These are the Bayesian posteriors for the distances. And I must admit, when I saw this, I was delighted. Not that they, this, okay, in M61, they land one on top of each other, but the other ones don't. And that's what was the delightful part, because this meant that the, this is a real measurement. The, the errors are not buried inside our statistics. There is a distribution. They are consistent, which is very good. And they are slightly different in most cases. Sometimes it lands on top, sometimes it doesn't. If they all landed on top, there'd be something I would say very weird in these measurements. But the method actually does give consistent distances. Whether they're correct or not is another statement. So now, uh, oh, what's happened here? Okay, I would like to just point out that this slide back here, sorry. These are independent measurements of distances. They're not cross-calibrated. Yeah, this, uh, this is why this slide is so emphatic, but I, there you go, okay? So the supernova models that we are uh, generating to determine the luminosity have no distance assumptions in them at all. They just, you fit the spectrum for its physical properties and the output of this is the brightness of the supernova. Okay? So they're not cross calibrated These are cross-checked. These are independent measurements. This is super important. Okay. This was so exciting, in fact, that uh, we have an entire program separated off from ad hoc, which is only doing siblings uh, that you know, for every, it actually looks. And if, there ha if there's a supernova type 2p in a galaxy that's had a type 2p, then we chase it up. And it's been given quite a lot of time on the VLT to, to do this. Okay, so now, is the distance that we determine plausible? Because if it's not plausible, so if we find, you know, I don't know, let's be silly, minus, it would, it would be a problem. They can't find minus, but uh, there's a prior against that. But anyway, it, it, is it is it reason? So uh, you can take uh, this uh, uh, case study here, where this galaxy has had a nice supernovae. It actually has a lot of photometry. Uh, it also has a very rich uh, variable star catalog, but no CFID distance yet for, for some reason it didn't. Okay. And there was a TRGB distance for this galaxy. So what uh, you know, uh, Geza did is he went and got the data and actually did a CFID distance to, uh, to this galaxy together uh, with uh, um, uh, did it, uh, uh, Christian and uh, I've forgotten uh, Anderson's first name. He, it isn't Joe Anderson, it's a different Anderson. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, it will come to me later, who is a, who is a CFID expert. Anyway, and they did the, the CFID distance to this galaxy and then compared it to the distance of the supernovae. And uh, so there is a, a, a supernova distance, the method I just described. And here we have the CFID distance determined uh, in red uh, from, from the photometry. We have the supernova distance and then a whole bunch of other distances that have been determined for various reasons different projects, including the TRGB, the planetary nebula luminosity function, surface resonance fluctuation, they're all good. 
and they're all within the capture range. I don't want you to take anything about the TRGB being uh, long in this. That's not the, the purpose of the slide. The purpose of the slide is only that you know, the 2P thing is not giving you a strange distance. And it is in the norms, it is in, in the physics that we expect. So the method is reproducible, testably reproducible. So on, on, you can actually run it on a different object expecting to get the, 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 the galaxy should have one distance and you recover the, the distances and it is accurate in, in, in both aspects. So this is super good. The question now is, does it actually work out to the redshift that we want? So we've done one run, one object out at a redshift of 0.4 to actually see whether we get, uh, uh, in effect, uh, a, a straight, a, a decent line, because this is not a measurement of H0 per se. It's not very accurate as a measurement of H0. But if it was broken somewhere, we would actually see it. So this is uh, running this on, on, on a few uh, couple of objects just to go out to the uh, register. So there's uh, ITPF 13 BX BJX and 12 CK, which are the ones in, in this you can see. It's very hard to see this. Uh, ITPF is here and uh, CK is here. Okay. And you get a number. I don't want you to pay any attention to, to, to the number nor, nor the error bar other than if somebody had said they'd measured H0 to this, you'd go, okay, it's another measurement. Go home and make the error bar small. You wouldn't say, eh, there's something wrong with your method. You'd go, go make your error bar small. And that's exactly what we're doing. We actually have 20 more uh, objects to put into this. It's, uh, and this is the work that is ongoing now. So before I conclude, I have one more slide after, after this one. Uh, there are some skeletons always, the things that we're not hiding, but they could be uh, the pitfall of this technique in terms of how far down the error bars can go, because how far down the error bars can go is a matter of parent population. And this is, one is that if the supernova is interacting with circumstellar material, then it appears brighter than its spectrum would indicate. So the photometry would have it brighter. And this is, this would actually have a noise in our system. So we're selecting supernova that show no signs of circumstellar interaction. But of course, circumstellar material is always, is always present. The question is, is it so low that it doesn't affect the matter? Is Feristi is also uh, a, a possibility, although that statistically goes away. Well, that the statistical part is not a problem. The question is whether it affects the radiative transfer in any particular way. But we believe that uh, the the dominant error will be the statistical one, which which does go away. There's no reason why they should point toward that, towards us or sideways. Um, the radiative transfer could be completely wrong. Uh, that has been cross-calibrated against other radiative transfer codes, and it does uh, seem to be okay, but evolution that may evolution in the code may take place. And of course, as always in astronomy, peculiar extinction could, uh, could be present, although we do fit for the extinction as part of the fitting, and it is actually the dominant uh, term in, uh, in our uncertainty, believe it or not. Um, the changing, we also allow the extinction law to change, but it could be that we have things that would be very, very strange. So, uh, to conclude, really conclude, uh, we're working on this. Uh, we're almost, uh, almost there. Uh, I would like to uh, recall a conversation Adam and I had uh, last summer at uh, a MIAP, uh, meeting in, in, in Garching, he turned around to me and he said, uh, well, he asked me if I thought that uh, the scrutiny that we had over the measurement, the acceleration measurement was uh, as hard as the scrutiny that we have on H naught. 
And I said, certainly not. Uh, it was much easier uh, then with uh, the acceleration than the problem with H0. And the, the essence of that really, and this is verbatim there, is that H0 is actually much harder uh, than measuring the acceleration of the universe because it is actually an absolute measurement rather than a relative. And in astronomy, an absolute measurement has a hard time. So I think I'll stop there and happily take uh, any any questions that people may may have. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting talk, and I think and thank you also for staying in time. And there is plenty of time for questions now. So. Yes, I would encourage uh, the participants either to raise their hands or, yes, uh, or like uh, unmute themselves and ask the questions. Yes, normally we stop the uh, recording at this point, so because that would require the agreement of all the participants to, uh, at least that's what we do. So then, I, okay, we usually, I mean, we continue recording, but okay. then, okay. but that's but that's fine. fine. I mean, yes, no, it's okay. Uh, it's just, uh, it's uh, up to you. Okay, fine. Okay, so shall I? Well, 